Hey guys, Mike here, the ED Troy Borg, with a look at the new HTC One M8. This is a successor to one of my favorite phones from 2013, the HTC One M7. So the M7 was one of my favorite phones for a number of reasons, including that beautiful 1080p LCD IPS display, 4.7 inches, which gave us a really high pixel density, made it one of the best looking displays out there. We also had those stereo speakers called HTC Boom Sound, making it one of the best sounding devices as well. And also that design made it one of the best looking devices. This nice aluminum construction, as you can see with that milled chamfered edge, just a beautiful phone all around, with a nice curved design, a nice hefty uh, solid construction. And of course we also had that four ultra pixel camera, which is kind of a controversial feature, just because it's a low resolution sensor. It's effectively four megapixels, but because they're ultra pixels, meaning they are larger, they did give us better low light performance and also had optical image stabilization. So the M8 aims to improve upon this device in a number of ways. So we have a larger five inch display, which also makes the phone larger. Uh, we pretty much have the same camera and the same speakers. We have a four ultra pixel camera, pretty much carried over, but this lacks optical image stabilization because we have some other new features here, including the secondary camera, which is used to pick up depth information. So this adds some interesting new features, which we'll explore in this video. Now we also have a new dual LED flash, which combines two different colors to give you the right flash color for the image. So this is similar to the True Tone flash on the iPhone 5S. All right, so I'm just gonna cut these seals on either side. So of course I have the AT&T version, so I have some specific literature aimed at AT&T customers. So you can see printed on the inside of the box, we have a quick start guide, looks like it's stuck to the plastic here. Tells us about the sensors and buttons and that sort of thing and where the nano SIM tray is. Now the HTC dot view cover is an accessory sold separately for $50. Basically it's a hard shell that snaps onto the back of the phone with a flip cover that covers the glass. and actually has perforations through the cover that uh, takes advantage of a software feature that actually kind of produces this sort of dot matrix effect so provides some information. Of course I will review this at a later date once I get my hands on one so we can explore exactly what that is. Now on the inside of the packaging, you'll see something called HTC Advantage, which is launching with this phone. And as you can see, the current benefits include free one-time crack screen replacement within the first six months of ownership. So if you crack it once, they will replace it for you. We also have Android software update commitment. So they will update this to the latest version of Android as it's released. So they will keep your phone updated. But of course, you can buy a Google Play version of this phone for about $700, which is actually what I did. So I did order one of those and I'll review that at a later date, but that will be running stock Android. Of course, that will be updated pretty regularly. So let's go ahead and pull this open. So we have a little tray here and there is our phone. This again is gunmetal. As you can see, it's a darker color. So let me set that aside for just a minute while we take a look at the contents. So inside we have our SIM ejection tool for the Nano SIM. We have safety and regulatory guide and warranty statement. And we also have our IMEI information along with our serial number. Then we have HTC stickers. We also have our accessories. So we have a micro USB charging cable here. So there you go, a standard micro USB charging cable. No USB 3.0 in this case like you get with the GS5. We also have some headphones. So these are not, of course, Beats headphones. They separated from the Beats partnership quite a while ago now. So this is just HCC's headphones. Now those headphones also come with replacement ear tips. And then we have our wall adapter. So this is an HCC branded wall adapter. So a nice wall adapter that's compact and portable. All right, so let's just unwrap our phone. All right, so let's take a close look at the design of the HTC One M8, which is one of the big stories with this phone. This is 90% metal. This is a unibody construction, 90% versus 70% from the last model, which wasn't unibody. As you can see, it had these plastic trim pieces along the side for the antennas to work through it. Now, this required some antenna breakthroughs in order to enable this design. Now, as you can see, it kind of has this polished aluminum surface with this hairline grain, which is different from the matte finish of the anodized aluminum we're used to with the M7. This gives it a more jewel-like appearance, as you can see, it really picks up the light really nicely. It just looks really nice, uh, certainly more interesting than kind of the flat texture of the last generation model. Now, this is available in three colors. I have the gunmetal color. The gunmetal color comes with these 
black antenna separators. So the plastic here is black. Now, if you got the silver version, it would have white, just like the M7. And then we also have a gold version, which also has these black trim pieces. So if you look really closely here, we can take a look at the camera module. So this is that four ultra pixel camera, which is effectively four megapixels. Four ultra pixels basically mean that these pixels are larger. They're about two microns as opposed to 1.2 microns. The idea here is that the sensor is more sensitive to low light conditions. We also have that new dual LED flash and that LED flash, as you can see, has two different colors. So combined, they give you a more natural light and the flash automatically adjusts to the scene you're shooting. You also see that duo camera feature, that secondary camera right there, which doesn't have a megapixel rating. It's just there to pick up uh, depth information. And I'll demonstrate that. Now in the antenna breaks here, you can see we have what we call zero gap construction. Basically, it looks like the plastic and the metal are all merged perfectly together. Uh, so it gives you a nice seamless look. You have that uh, microphone built in. Uh, just like you did with the M7. If you look at the edge of the M8, you can see the metal completely wraps around the edges of the phone and meets the glass with this nice polished chamfered edge. Really nice seamless design. Now at the top of the phone, you'll find a five megapixel front facing camera with a wide angle lens. You also find your ambient light sensor and proximity sensor right next to that. Then you'll find one of your stereo speakers and kind of hidden in the stereo speaker is a little LED notification light. Now at the bottom, you'll find the other speaker grill as well as your mouthpiece. Now, if you look really closely here, you can see that the speaker really only occupies about half of the speaker grill. The rest of it is just there for symmetry. You also find your mouthpiece kind of hidden in there. Now, notably, this material here is kind of a grainy plastic. It's got this sort of grain to it, but it's plastic instead of metal like it was on the last phone. So it's there mostly to pick up on the glossy design of the glass, but it's a little different. So if, again, if you look at the M7, you can see this was an aluminum piece that went edge to edge. Uh, the design is a little different this time. Now we still have this black bezel toward the bottom of the screen. Now that used to house capacitive controls on the M7, but those have been moved to the screen this time. So it would have been nice if they eliminated that. Now, once again, toward the top, we'll find our IR blaster, which is now much larger than it was before. Uh, with the M7, it was just integrated into the lock button, but now you can see it spans the entire width of the top of the phone. So if you bring in the M7, you can take a look at the design difference here. Now, you can also see that they've moved the location of the lock button. So it's now uh, left-hand side instead of right-hand side, possibly to give it a little better ergonomics. You can also see that uh, the headphone jack has now been moved. That is at the bottom of the phone. Now toward the bottom of the phone, you find your micro USB charging port as well as your headphone jack. I definitely prefer the headphone jack to be mounted on the bottom as opposed to the top. Now on the right hand side, you have your volume rocker, which is also metal. You also have your micro SD card slot, which supports up to 128 gigs. So you can get a 16 or 32 gig capacity version, uh, but uh, you can also expand storage externally up to 128 gigs now that we have 128 gig micro SD cards. Now toward the other side, we'll find our SIM tray, which is larger. So this uses a nano SIM. So let me go ahead and inject these so you can take a look at them. All right, so to pop out the tray, just insert your SIM ejection tool. The tray pops out. As you can see, it's a nice metal tray. So again, uh, high quality. Quality. Pop in your SIM, pop it back in, and it's completely flush. Now it's the same story with the micro SD card slot. Just pop it out. So there you go, you can add your SD card and pop it in. Now if we look at the M7 and M8 together, you can see that the M8 is quite a bit larger than the M7. It's especially significantly taller. Now if you place them over on top of each other, you can also see that the M8 is a bit wider than the M7, which is a little hard to see here. It's just slight. Now, the interesting thing here is that both phones kind of have a uh, angled edge. So if you look at the edges of the phone, you can see that both of them kind of have this little angle. So the back of the phone is slightly larger than the front of the phone. You can also see the design is somewhat similar, but uh, better this time. You can see again, mostly unibody construction. So the metal completely wraps the phone as opposed to the plastic we had before. Now, as you can see, we did have a few more metal chamfers here, which look pretty nice. Uh, but uh, this is a much simpler, cleaner design, which also feels really nice in the hand. You no longer have these sharper edges around it. So if you look at the bottom again, you can see the micro USB charging port is in the same location, but we now have a, a headphone jack down there. We also had another microphone. 
along the side. We still have our volume rocker along the side. Uh, this time it's slightly different design. And as you can see, we also have a SIM tr uh, a, a SD card slot this time, and we didn't have that before. Now along the left-hand edge, you had your SIM slot. Now ironically, this was a micro SIM, and this is a nano SIM, yet the tray is larger with the nano SIM. Now if you look at the top of the phone, again, the HTC One M7 had a two megapixel camera as opposed to a five megapixel camera. And you can see that these sensors have moved around a bit. And toward the bottom, we had those off-screen Android controls, which consisted only of a home and back button. So with the new phone, you do get a few more, but they just appear on the screen. Now, the camera specs are very similar for ultra pixels, although the M7 had optical image stabilization, which the M8 does not have. But of course, we have a few other features and we have improved software stabilization to compensate. All right, so let's take a look at the user interface. Again, this is running Android 4.4.2 with HTC Sense 6. That's HTC skin over Android. So this is running the latest version of Android and it introduces some interesting new features, including motion launch. So in a lock state, you can double tap the locks or the uh, glass on the screen to get you to the lock screen. Now it's not necessarily reliable. It doesn't happen all the time. I've had some issue with it working reliably. Uh, it's using motion in order to determine whether you intend to unlock it, not just the tap of your finger. So when you double tap the lock screen, it wakes it up for you so you can quickly glance the clock as well as the weather information and your notifications. You can put it back to sleep by double tapping it. You can also swipe to the left to get you to the widget panel. You can swipe to the right to get to blink feed. You can swipe down to get to voice dialing. And then you can swipe up to directly unlock the phone and take you to your last home screen. So let's try it again. So if I go here, it takes you right to there. And if I was in an app, the same thing would happen. So if I swipe up now, take me directly to where I last left off. Now, if you look down here, you can tap and hold this icon to get to some other options here. So you can swipe to the right to get to blink feed. You can swipe to the left to take you to the widget panel or your home screen and swipe up to unlock it to wherever you last were. Also from that, uh, lock screen, you can access your uh, dock. So this, these are the apps that appear in your dock. So for example, you can swipe up to get to the browser or swipe up to the get to the camera. So if you want to change what appears on your lock screen, all you have to do is change what appears in your dock on the home screen. Now, finally, we have standard Android control. So we have our recent apps, which takes us to our recent apps viewer, which is a little different than stock Android. Actually, it's very different from stock Android. So you get this grid view, which allows us to see up to nine suspended apps at once. And you can click on any one of them to open them up, take you directly to the recent app. And uh, you can also close them all the way just by swiping them up. Now up here, you can take, go right to the app manager. So you can see apps that are running, uh, on the SD card, download and that sort of thing. And here you can manage that. And alternatively, we can tap here to close them all. Now we also have full Google Now integration right from the lock screen. So we can say things, okay, Google, set an appointment for tomorrow at 8 a.m. to get this review posted. Touch to continue. Okay, Google, take a photo. Opening app. Now taking a look at our notification shade, of course we have our expandable notifications and up here you can go to your quick settings toggles and this is where you can change things like your brightness. So you can toggle between darker and brighter and automatic and that sort of thing. You have airplane mode, your Wi-Fi settings, Bluetooth, power saving mode, auto rotate, mobile data, which you can toggle on and off, vibrate and do not disturb. And as you can see, some of these have these little indicators, which tells us there are additional settings. So if you tap on that, it takes you directly to the settings panel. We can modify those settings. Alternatively, you could also just tap and hold any one of these settings to get to them like Bluetooth. Now you can also edit these so you can rearrange them as you can see here and you can add new ones. So if you go down here, you can see that these items are hidden. You just have to drag and drop them to the quick settings panel up here. So all you have to do is tap and hold these and rearrange them. So they'll change the hierarchy. But if you want to add some, you can add up to 12. So you can see I have 11 out of 12 added. Uh, I can add one more and beyond that, I have to remove one to add another one. So if I want to add mobile hotspot, I can do that. But now I can't add additional ones without ones being moved. So you can see some of the additional ones include screenshot, mobile hotspot, GPS, data roaming, media output, auto sync, ringtone, screen timeout, sync all, data usage, HTC Mini Plus, which is a sort of peripheral that allows you to kind of use your cell phone as a house phone with a handset, and then NFC technology, which is built in here. So you can toggle that on and off if you want. Now to edit our home screens, we can pinch in and out, and this will give us access to things like widgets, apps, 
as well as shortcuts. So we can basically grab anything from these panels and drag them up to our home screen. So you can see we can also add home screens and remove home screens and set which one we want to be our home screen. So for example, this is the default home screen, which is highlighted with that uh, home icon. So if you want to add, for example, blink feed as your home screen, just tap and hold on it and set it as your home screen. So now that's your home screen. So if I hit home, will take me to blink feed instead. So you can see by default, this is your home screen. It used to be that uh, blink feed was the home screen. So let's pinch in and out again and set that as my home screen. And as you can see, I have a spare panel right here, which I can remove if I want. So I can go ahead up here, drop it to remove and it removes it for me, or I can add new ones. I also have an editor up here. So it allows me to see exactly which one is my home screen more easily, or I can remove the panel. Now I can also drag and drop widgets or apps to this home screen. So for example, let's see if I wanna add Beats Music to the home screen. I can see I can add it to that home screen, so it's made it red, but I can add it to this one, and I can just drop it into place. Now the next thing I wanna take a look at is Blink Feed, which aggregates everything from your social media accounts to your news stories, to your calendar and photo galleries, to even your Fitbit information. So everything appears here. The idea here is instead of going to separate apps to get to all that information, it automatically feeds into this Blink feed, which gives you infinite scrolling. Just scroll through your timeline and it updates for you automatically. So the idea here is that you can get pretty lost in Blink feed, reading and catching up on all the news stories available to you. I actually really like this feature. It is a big time waster, however, because I do find myself constantly looking at it to check the latest news stories. Now, as you can see, when I swipe down, it updates the feed for you. So there's always new stuff to look at. Now, uh, if you look at the news stories here, you can see, you can identify exactly the source of them. So you can see this one's from Facebook. You can see this one is from TechCrunch, which is a uh, one of the headlines I follow. I also have Twitter, that sort of thing. So all of that is in here, Boy Genius Report. So if I tap on this, it takes me directly to that article and I can take a look at it. I can even swipe through my news stories in that full screen viewer. Now, if I swipe to the right, I can select what appears in my feed. So you can see all the things that I've added to my Blink feed. That includes things like uh, headline news, which includes Associated Press, Automobiles, which includes Auto Blog, Science and Technology, which includes BGR, TechCrunch, Techno Buffalo, and The Verge. And then I have apps that take advantage of Blink feed, such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Google Plus. And all this is highly customizable. Now, if you look up here, you'll see these custom topics. So I created these topics just by searching for Android and HTC. So I can go up here to create a custom topic. So I could just type in Star Trek. So I can search for Star Trek. And then I have this little option here to add it to my Blink feed. So now if I go back to Blink feed, it will be updated for Star Trek stories. Or if I just wanna see Star Trek stories, I can tap on that and it will just show Star Trek stories in my Blink feed. Now I can do that with all these topics. So if I just wanna see Instagram, just tap Instagram. If I just wanna see Twitter, updates for Twitter only. But if I wanna see it all, just tap highlights. Now you have more options up here, including Compose. So you can post directly to Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus from Blink Feed. So you can post on Facebook, so you get the Facebook interface. Under Services and Apps, we can add specific apps to Blink Feed. So you can see Instagram, Google Plus, Facebook, the calendar. So my calendar events will appear in here as well. My gallery, the Zoe gallery will appear, Twitter, as well as the TV app. So you can see your upcoming programming appear directly in your Blink Feed. Now we can also add additional content. Uh, so you can see we have various categories to pick from, automobiles, business, design, entertainment, gaming, the lifestyle, we have some promoted categories, uh, music, politics, sports, science and technology, and world. So if I go to science and technology, you can see all the things that are available under science and technology, crackberry.com, gadgets, geek.com, imore.com. So if I select these, these will be added to my feed as well. Now I can also remove content from here. So I can see again, all the feeds that are available to me. So if I wanna remove any one of these, I can go ahead and select them and it allows me to remove them. So I can also go to science and technology and edit exactly what appears in my feed. So if I wanna remove TechCrunch, just select that and remove it. Now let's take a look at the app drawers. In the app drawer, you can see that we can arrange them into folders and they've already done that for us. Some of the apps include uh, ones that AT&T have added. Of course, we have the standard array of Google apps in here as well. And we have our media apps, which include an FM radio. So all I have to do is connect a pair of headphones. So let me go ahead and show you that. Now it automatically scans your airways for the available channels. So for example, if we want this one, we can select the favorite and add it to our favorites. And uh, we can go to our favorites and see all the stations we have favorited. 
There you go. Now you can drag and drop any one of these apps to the home screen. So you can see that uh, we can drop it onto one of the home screens. Or if we tap and hold here, we can take it up to remove. Also, we can uninstall some of these. So if we tap and hold on this, we can take it up to uninstall or we can cancel this operation entirely. Now up here, you can arrange your apps by custom, which is the default, alphabetical, which takes them out of the folders. As you can see here, they're no longer in their folders. Uh, so custom preserves the foldering. And then we have most recent. So whatever you've added most recently will appear toward the top. So I prefer custom just to keep everything in those folders. Now up here, you also have quick access to the Play Store, which is very convenient. So you don't have to find the app. It's always in the app drawer. And then we have search. So you can search for your app as opposed to uh, kind of hunting around for it. You also have your editor here. So you can rearrange the apps, just press and hold them. And this is how you create folders. So if you want to create a folder, that's how you do it. You can also uninstall them this way, or you can hide the app instead of uninstalling it. We can also hide and unhide apps, and you can select them that way as well. And then we have manage apps. This takes you to your app manager. Now we also have grid size. So you can change this to three by four, which is default or four by five to give you a denser view. All right, so let's take a look at our settings panel and a lot can be revealed about a phone under settings. So we have airplane mode, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth and mobile data, pretty much standard stuff. So if you go to any one of these categories, just tap on it, it takes you to your editor and your options. We also have media output. So this device supports DLNA. So it sees my Pioneer AV receiver on my Wi-Fi network. So I can use DLNA to broadcast media to that device. It also supports HTC, uh, looks like HTC Media Link. Uh, so you can, uh, if you have a device that supports HTC Media Link, it will stream to that. Uh, HTC also sells a separate product for that. Now under more, you'll find your data manager. So you find all of that information here and you can manage specifically what uses your mobile data. You also have your default SMS app. You can see I'm using Hangouts as the default app, but it comes with this messages app by default. You also have VPN, mobile network sharing, uh, ACC Mini Plus, which is a sort of accessory. Now in terms of personalized, we have a few options here. So we have home screen, home screen wallpaper, apps and widgets, manage home screen pages, that sort of thing. All of that's available from the home screen with that pinch action, or you can tap and hold on the home screen to get to those editors. Uh, now the thing I wanna take a look at here is themes. So you can see there's a variety of themes here. One is the default theme. This changes the entire UI coloring and the wallpaper as well. So for example, if we pick this theme here, you can see all the color palette at the top. If we go with that, apply that, yes. And we now go to home screen, you can see we have this kind of cooler color. Uh, it extends right to blink feed. So instead of green, you now have this bluish cobalt color. Now, another setting you'll see here is browser bar, which is unique to the AT&T HTC One. If you tap on this, uh, basically what it does is add this browser bar to give you additional utility, uh, something that AT&T likes. I never activate it, but it's available for both the standard WebKit browser as well as the Chrome browser. Accounts in sync, this is where you can add additional accounts such as Facebook, Google, your email accounts, Instagram, Twitter, that sort of thing, that's all in here. We have location services, and you can see which apps are using your locations. Uh, we also have security, so this is where you adjust your security settings, including enable lock screen widgets, which is off by default. Now we also have this transfer utility that allows you to transfer your contacts, messages, photos, videos, music, and more from your old phone. If you tap on that, you can select an HTC Android phone, another Android phone, an iPhone, or other phones such as Blackberries, Windows phones, and others. Uh, so it allows you to transfer to your new phone pretty easily. Display and gesture. So there's a lot of things under here. You can enable auto rotate. You can change your font style and font size, brightness, screen timeout. You have that daydream feature, the notification LED light. So if you tap on that, you can see exactly what will activate that LED light up here. You also have your motion launch gestures. So you can see we have several options here related to what motion launch is. And if you're not familiar with what they are, this will explain them for you. Now we have this toggle for boom sound, which is grayed out when using the internal speaker. So it's on by default. However, if you connect external speakers or a headset, you now have the option to toggle that on and off. So if you prefer not to have that processing in there and use another equalizer, you could do that. Now under sound, we'll find our sound profile. So you can set to normal, vibrate, or silent. We have our volume, which you can adjust, uh, but you can also adjust the volume by tapping this volume button. And you can select that gear icon to adjust other volume settings. You can change your ringtone as well. Now we also have something called quiet ring on pickup. So if you move the phone while it's ringing, it will lower the volume. And alternatively, if it's in your pocket or bag, it will ring louder for you. Now we also have our apps manager here. So we can see download on the SD card, what's running and all. If you tap on any one of these, you can disable, force stop, uninstall updates, stuff like that. We also have our storage. So we can see how much storage we're taking up and exactly what's taking up our storage. 
We also have our battery manager, which is pretty good. I mean, this is this phone has pretty good battery life. HTC did say we get about 40% better battery life with this phone. I was able to get about 13 hours out of a full charge, and that left me with 33%, which is pretty comfortable. So that's a full day of charge with fairly moderate usage. And we also have our language and keyboard settings, date and time, printing options, so we can see our printing profiles. I have Cloud Print and HP Service Plugin, and TAT software updates, and we also have about, so you can see exactly what's going on with this device. So we can see software information, we can see HTC Sense 6.0 as well as Android 4.4.2. Now if you're in an app that supports wireless media output such as DLNA, all you have to do is use a three finger gesture to activate that feature. So right now it sees two devices. Well, it actually just sees one device on my network, my Pioneer AV receiver, which is a DLNA device. So I can broadcast the audio or video to that device, or I can select my phone. So I can select my AV receiver, there we go. So it's one way of kind of bringing AirPlay-like uh, capabilities to this device. Now, of course, we have these HCC Boom Sound Stereo front-facing speakers, which deliver superb sound. They're even 25% louder than the M7. And with redesigned sound chambers, they now give you better better depth of sound and bass response, and the effect is fantastic. It's still the best sounding mobile device you can get right now, and it's pretty nice to listen to. So let's see if we can hear this on camera. <laughs> we have an IR blaster at the top with an app that allows you to control it. So when you set up this app for the first time, you just set up your service and your location and it automatically provides you with a TV guide. So instead of using the on-screen controls of your cable box, in theory, you could just use this. And this allows you to quickly access your favorite channels and see what's on currently. So for example, if I wanna watch Law & Order, just tap on that, hit Watch Now, and it sends the IR code to the TV to change the channel. So now I can go to my remote control. So I have my on-screen remote control and I can control my AV equipment. That includes my AV receiver, my TV, and my cable box. So I have channel up, I have my navigation controls, I have my menu, everything is here for quick access. Now, if you ever leave this app, you have quick access from the drop-down notification sheet. So as you can see up here, you have this little widget that allows you to quickly regain access to that app. Now there's one more motion gesture feature. So if you quickly turn it to landscape orientation and hit the volume button, whether it's up or down, it doesn't matter, it will launch the camera for you. So it's a quick way of accessing the camera, but it can be tricky sometimes. If you're too slow, it won't work. So let's try this again. So if I move it to landscape orientation and then hit the volume button, nothing happens. So it has to be a specific intentional motion in order for that to work. Now next up is the camera app and there's a lot going on here. So in the upper left corner here, we'll find our modes, which we can cycle through. So we have the camera mode video, the Zoe camera, the selfie camera, dual capture and pan 360. So first let's take a look at the camera, get the basics out of the way. So we can tap to focus, changes the exposure and it's pretty quick. I mean the uh, tap to focus uh, feature. The focusing on this is really fast. It's much faster. I think they said 50% faster than it was last year. Uh, so this is a much faster camera. Now you can take your photo and of course you can tap and hold on it to take burst photos. You can take up to 20, I believe, at once. And then it, it lets you pick among those photos, which one you want to be the best photo. You can select best photo and click OK and we'll save only that photo. Of course, you can also select your flash, whether you want that turned on, off or automatic. And then we have lots and lots of options. So if you go up here, you see a little option icon. And uh, if you go here, you have your settings and they include things such as makeup level, image adjustment, which you can modify, contrast, saturation, sharpness. Uh, we have our crop settings. So you can do 16 by nine, four by three, or one by one. You can enable your grid, geotag, which is off by default. So you can enable that. Review duration, which is off, but you can select that if you want. You also have self timer, so you can enable the self timer. You have continuous shooting options, which are on by default. Basically, you hold down the shutter release and it gives you that uh, option to con continue taking those photos. 
Camera options include auto smile capture, touch to capture. So if you want to uh, take an image right after you tap the screen, you can do that. So for example, if you want to focus and then take the picture right away, that's an option. You also have the shutter sound, which you can turn off. Now under volume button options, I can change the behavior of the volume control when in camera mode. So I could use it by default, which is to operate as the volume control, or I can use it as my capture button, or I could use it as my zoom button. So if I select capture, when I hit the volume button, it takes the photo and I can also use it as my zoom controller here. So now I can use my volume button to zoom in and out, or alternatively, I could just use pinch to zoom. So now I can use my volume button to zoom in and out, or I can just use pinch to zoom instead. And if you want to reset to default, just click reset takes it back to factory defaults. We also have auto white balance. So we have auto white balance or we have incandescent, fluorescent, daylight and cloudy. We have our EV values as well. So you can change the exposure value. Then we have our ISO settings so we can change our sensitivity to auto or 200 or all the way up to 1600. And then we have our auto mode. See, these are our scene modes. Uh, they're not labeled until you touch them. So you can see exactly what they are. You have night mode, HDR, panorama. You have anti-shake manual mode. It allows you to manually adjust things like your aperture and the ISO settings and that sort of thing. We also have portraits, landscape, and backlight, text, as well as macro shooting. So let's go back to auto. And it looks like I'm going to change my uh, white balance back to auto white balance. So there you go, lots and lots of camera options on this one. Now getting back to our modes here, we have our video mode. So under video mode, we can shoot our video. And then we can capture a photo at the same time and stop it. Also under video, we do have tap to focus while recording and we can pinch in and out to zoom it. Now video has lots of options here so we can change our resolution to from full HD to anything less than full HD, review duration, camera options, a lot of things we saw with the uh, still camera. Now the video camera has some interesting options here, including slow motion video. So similar to the iPhone 5S, you can record the video at a higher frame rate and then slow it down in post. We also have full HD at 60 frames per second for really smooth video. And then we have full HDR video. Now we also have the selfie camera. This is that five megapixel front facing camera, which is one of the best uh, front facing cameras you can get right now with a wide angle lens. And I'll post a sample video at the end of this video so you get an idea of how it performs. So you can see things like a timer. You can change the scene from HDR. So you have HDR with this camera if you want. Auto, uh, our timer. We have our EV values, our white balance, our effects, and our settings. If you go to our settings here, you see all these settings that are available, which include many of the ones that are on the main camera, which is kind of interesting because this camera has more megapixels than the rear-facing camera. Now, if you're in the camera mode, you can quickly switch between the front facing and rear facing camera just by swiping up or down. Now we also have dual capture, which as the name suggests, allows you to record both the front facing and rear facing camera at the same time. You can move around the thumbnail here. This is the front facing camera and, and you can record it or take a photo of both cameras at once. The idea here is to capture both the subject and the recorder at the same time. So you can take a photo, it takes the photo. If you look at it now, you'll see that I'm included here. So let's go back to the camera, which also works with video. So if we record video, there I am, and I can still move it around while recording video and I can resize it. So pretty familiar if you're used to Samsung devices, they have this feature as well. Now the Zoe camera allows you to take both photos and videos at the same time. So for example, I can just take a photo, takes a single photo, I can tap and hold it to record a short video segment, or I can tap and hold this and record a longer video segment. So it continues recording when I lift off my finger if I've held it for about three seconds and then I can click stop. Now what this does is it allows me to go to my gallery and select an image from that uh, video as the photograph. So as you can see, I have several options here to select which frame of that video I want. Click save frame. So that saves a photo and I still retain the video with it. In fact, if I go to my gallery, you'll see these little thumbnails indicating which one are Zoe. So you can see all these Zoe's I took and these are the still frames. And then I can also see what our video. So there's a difference between what a Zoe is and what a video is. Uh, so here we can go to a Zoe right here. Take a look at it. Yes. To start 
And once again, it allows me to select a specific frame from that Zoe as my picture. Now this gives me an opportunity to take a look at the new camera gallery. So as you can see up here, you get this little highlight reel of all your photos, which takes advantage of Zoe and the duo camera uh, technology, which gives you that 3D effect. So you get this little uh, animation up here uh, and it kind of moves around randomly. So there you go, see some of the effects along with that 3D effect with that duo camera. You can also see your galleries here, or your albums. You can see your camera shots, your highlights, which are also animated because they include those Zoe's and videos. We also have Instagram, and we can see all the locations which the photos were shot in, so you can see in Rochester Hills. And then you have your camera, which you can jump to pretty quickly. Now you can also pinch in and out to zoom in on your gallery. So as you pinch out, your gallery expands for you in this, this sort of full timeline viewer. Now, as I said, we have this little camera up here that records dimensional information. Now this records it for any photo you take. So you don't have to activate it, it's always there. So I have this photo of my dog, and right now it's just a normal photo. But if I go to my editor, you can see I get lots of options. So one of them is unfocus. So basically it allows me to select the focus of the image, whether it's the face of my dog or the background. So you'll see the face of my dog goes blurry, but the background is in focus and then vice versa. Now this really isn't refocusing the image, it's just applying a smarter filter, a smart blur filter, because it knows the depth of the photo. It knows what's in the foreground, it knows what's in the background. Now, I also have foregrounders. So if I select foregrounder, I get some effects here. So I have sketch effect. So I can tap anywhere to set the foreground. So my dog is the foreground. I can do the zoom blur. So again, zooms out the, or blurs out the background, the cartoon effect and the colorizer. So you have lots of options here. Now we also have seasons, which again uses that dimensional information to determine the foreground subject. So all of these sort of effects kind of fall around the subject. So we have dandelion, maple leaf, snow. Now the most interesting feature here is Dimension Plus, which kind of turns this two dimensional image into a 3D image. So you can see it's using the accelerometer. So as I move the phone around, it gives a little 3D effect to my image. It looks pretty neat. I can toggle this off so I can now use my finger to uh, change the angle of the image. We also have stickers. So we have a variety of stickers we can pick from. So if I want to give my dog sunglasses, I could do that. Now in terms of camera performance, I'm pretty impressed with the flash or without the flash. So without the flash, you get excellent low light performance. So images look pretty sharp with minimal color noise. So I can really zoom in here. So this is just a normal shot taken in daylight in a fairly dark room. So you can see there's some graininess to the uh, image at the edges, but otherwise it's pretty decent, better than most cameras can pull off. And then with the flash, you get really uh, accurate color rep reproductions. You get really natural light. Now in terms of really low light performance, these images were not taken with the HDR settings. This is just auto. You can see that performance is pretty good. Again, this is a pitch black night and I just have my landscape lighting and my porch lights on and it does a nice job sort of filling out the scene. I mean, this looks brighter than it would normally. If you're just looking at my house, this looks a little bit brighter. Uh, so it does a nice job. It's not too noisy, not too grainy. And it does a very nice job quickly finding focus. That tends to be a problem with low light performance. The camera just spends too much time trying to find focus. This focus is really fast. That also means you don't necessarily need optical image stabilization uh, because the camera can find focus pretty quickly. Now this camera also has an excellent flash. So here we have an image without a flash. Here we have it with a flash. So you can see it does a nice job preserving the natural color with that flash while still filling in the scene. It just looks perfectly balanced. It's done a very nice job. Now, one of my favorite aspects of this device is that beautiful five inch LCD IPS display, full 1080p resolution with a pixel density of 440. So we have excellent off axis viewing, deep blacks, vivid colors, nice accurate display. Now, if you look at even the smallest text, it's really sharp. So this is an excellent e-reader if you wanna use it for that. It's also a good size for that. So again, whites look very bright and vivid and clear and it looks excellent off axis and text just looks very sharp and crisp even before you zoom in. Now, now, if we take a look at our Geekbench scores compared to last year's model, you can see there's a huge jump here. So the M7 had a uh, Snapdragon 600 processor. This has the 801 processor, both quad core. This was clocked at 1.7 gigahertz. This is clocked at 2.3 gigahertz. So there's a lot more horsepower here now. So we go from 625 to 916 and 1826 all the way up to 2400. So you do see some performance improvements. 
Now, I never found the HTC One M7 to be a slow phone by any means, and this phone is no exception with all that power behind it. This is a fast moving phone despite HTC Sense 6, which is a fairly light skin. It's a pretty efficient skin. There's not a lot of bloated features here, so it runs pretty lean and clean, and I'm pretty impressed overall by system performance, and I have absolutely no gripes here with the HTC One M8. I find it to be a very fast phone, and it's right up there with operating a Nexus 5 running stock Android, so I'm pretty impressed overall with performance. Now there is a lot to like about this phone. The beautiful construction quality, excellent materials, beautiful 5 inch 1080p LCD IPS display, one of the best out there and it's by far the best sounding phone you can buy right now. It's also quick running, smooth and efficient, has a lot of interesting software features that are actually useful, especially those lock screen features, which I really like. Now really my only gripe with this phone is the location of the lock button. It's kind of far up there and it's not a very tactile button. It's really a flush to this plastic and because it's the same material, it's kind of hard to feel for it. But the other problem here is that when I go to grip that phone to hit the lock button, I'm constantly hitting the Vine button along the side. This works in either the right hand position or the left hand position, but of course your hands may vary, but for me I find that I'm constantly mashing all the buttons at once trying to hit that lock button. But of course, with those gestures and motion gesture features, you don't have to use this as much, but you still have to use that in order to lock the screen. Now, before I leave, I can already tell you that this is one of my favorite phones for 2014. So by the end of the year, I'm sure this will be at the top. So thanks for watching and I'll see you again in the next video. All right, guys, this is Mike the Detroit Borg testing out the front facing camera. Again, five megapixels with a wide angle lens and stereo microphone pickup. So you should get excellent video and audio out of this. You do have HDR in this camera as well as uh, a full 1080p 30 frames per second video recording. So now we're testing out the ultra pixel camera which actually has fewer pixels, but of course they're larger pixels so performance should be a bit better. But again, stereo pickup, 1080p 30 frames per second. We also have 720p at, at 60 frames per second. So we have lots of capabilities with this camera as well. All right, so here we are with Zoe and Chloe in my foyer, just testing out the rear-facing camera. So this is indoors, gives you an idea of indoor performance as well as the microphone. Of course, we do have tap to focus, but it does autofocus automatically as well for you. And then we can pinch in and out to zoom, which is just digital zooming, kind of digital cropping, so it's not the best zoom in the world. All right, so let's go outside and take some shots out there as well. Ha, ha, ha.